Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, dear colleagues, let me first thank all of you for attending this special seminar, which I hope will be intellectually fruitful and interesting for all of us, uh, certainly for me. Uh, allow me, without being too formal, to thank very deeply the Universitat Oberta de Catalunya uh, because of uh, their interest in organizing this symposium. I'm extremely happy to be here today and what is one of, uh, has been for many years and to some extent still is my intellectual home. Um, and I want to uh, personalize uh, these uh, thanks uh, uh, in the rector, uh, Dr. Josep Ranells, uh, who has covered all this research and activity and uh, has uh, uh, supported the organization of this seminar and has uh, strengthened the intellectual relationship that we have had over the years, personally and institutionally. And certainly, my dear colleagues, Mireya Fernandez Ardevol and Ramon Rivera, professors and researchers at the uh, Institute for uh, Interdisciplinary Study of the Internet, IM3, who took the initiative years ago of organizing this uh, symposium uh, in the context of the 20th anniversary of the creation of the Research Institute, but coincided with the publication, in fact, of the last volume of uh, Materiality, uh, three years, 96, 2000. And I, I really, I'm very grateful to them, not only for their original interest, because they kept uh, the project and the idea of organizing this symposium through the pandemics, which is quite remarkable. And I am particularly, particularly grateful to all the two of them, and I hope that this symposium will lead to further development of our collaboration. Let me use uh, the, the, these minutes of introduction to rethink to some extent uh, the connection between the theory of the network society that conceptualized about 20 years ago and, um, and current developments. Some of you know that for me, in epistemological terms, the theory is a good theory when and only when it becomes useful to understand reality, to understand the matter in its diversity, and in a, the case of social sciences, the living conscious matter. Um, so, to a large extent, all the other things are mediations. Ultimately, the test for a good theory is if it is a good tool to understand and for those of us who would like or feel committed to transform society. I still believe in the uh, inscription in Mars Thumb in Highgate Cemetery. Um, in the preface of the 2010 edition of the Network Society, I wrote a long, uh, text on trying to, to see in the 10 years uh, that had passed between the publication and this new edition, what had happened and how this could be, retro to some extent, in retrospect, uh, explained or at least clarified by uh, the concepts and the hypothesis contained in uh, the uh, book on the Network Society. Now, 10 years later, and with much less care, because my current duties uh, are make difficult to have the same kind of in-depth reflection for a long time, but I would like to do a similar exercise. Uh, what happened in the last 10 years and what is happening now and see how much uh, the theory of the network society helps us 
to understand or not uh, current developments. Simply to remind you that uh, in my theory, the network societies, very precise, is the social structure of, the, of our age, the information age. And because it is a global social structure, it refers to all societies, although with extreme cultural and institutional diversity, depending on the context in which this theory, uh, this social structure manifests itself. It's to some extent similar with the use of the concept of industrial society, in which at the same time there is some common nucleus, and at the same time institutional and cultural diversity, depending on, on countries and, and, and space and time. Of course, the existence and deployment of the network society does not supersede quite capitalism, quite the contrary. In many areas of the world, we are in the most capitalist society that we have ever been, but it's a different axis. It's not the same. Uh, the network society refers to the social structure, capitalism refers to the structure of the social appropriation of uh, production and wealth. The fundamental nucleus of our time is constituted around this um, network society in which not everybody is included because networks, remember always, include and exclude at the same time. However, the exclusion is also a derivative of the logic of network inclusion. It's the same process seen from two different points of the networking logic. Well, this is simply a reminder, uh, just in case uh, uh, we have stopped the discussion on the basic concept, not to have to, to reassess this matter. Let me first uh, identify some changes uh, in, the, in, the, in the theory in continuity with what was the nucleus of the theory. As Professor David Mejias, uh, the director of IN3, mentioned, uh, it's extraordinary uh, the development of the technological, social, cultural transformation in the last 20 years, and I would say in the last 10 years. Internet-based social networks have become the platform of everything, of sociability, of literally everything. And all activities have been basically digitized. At the nucleus of every human activity, there is a digital network that connects to other digital networks. This is, frankly, I don't predict, I try to predict the past is safer. Uh, but what I could see very early on is that the logic, the expanding logic of these networks and the impact on different levels of uh, the social structure uh, we're going to be uh, increasingly able to comprehend all activities, all uh, uh, processes, really, of everything we do. At the same time, we, therefore, we have seen a widespread extension of these network platforms and an acceleration in terms of its ability to increase uh, uh, volume, speed, and latency in terms of the relationship between these networks. Concretely speaking, uh, I think now, we really now, we have the full expansion of artificial intelligence, which until now was kind of science fiction, promise, possibility, now that's it. It's spreading all over and fundamentally transforming much of what we do, the famous, um, notion of uh, the expansion of data bases and data as the key element in society, data without artificial intelligence is nothing. So when we say data, we say artificial intelligence at the same time. And in terms of the communication, in terms of the theory, literally the 5G uh, uh, transforms uh, everything. Uh, it's, it's not more speed or more volume, more capacity, more latency. It's qualitatively different. Um, and the combination of both is what is truly transforming 
everything we do. And so we know that social movements are transformed, as I have tried to uh, argue in several empirically grounded books, as well as counter social movements. Um, politics is transformed. It has become essentially media politics and informational politics, another part of my uh, later research in my book, Communication Power. At the same time, territorial transformation uh, has been considerable. This type of global networking of in the entire economy and the, all the activities have translated into in territorial terms in the formation of new spatial forms, what I call metropolitan regions, or the gigantic expanses of territorial expanses of territories in which everything happens and at the same time with uh, extreme uh, processes of concentration, and dispersion, uh, accumulation of wealth and power, and widespread marginality. We are in a, increasingly in a massively urbanized planet, which already the majority of the population live in cities, uh, a substantial proportion live in uh, mega metropolitan regions, and by the year 2050, which is not so far away, uh, about 80% of the planet will be urbanized. So the process is accelerating rapidly. And at the same time, the populations of the world are dramatically shifting in terms of the ethnic, uh, political, geopolitical, and cultural uh, makeup. I just remind you for my European friends uh, that um, the population of Europe at this point is just Europe, all of Europe, 6% of the world population. We, we should reflect a little bit about that uh, because the, the mind frame uh, doesn't adapt easily to such tectonic changes. In this process of um, marginal mega-urbanization has been linked directly to the breakdown of the social fabric in many areas of the world, uh, which uh, social solidarity uh, disappearing, survival struggle and massive individualization, only the family becomes some refuge, but everything else increasingly disintegrates extreme individualism, which is pushed and favored both by marginality and by the extreme liberal individualistic ideology, which links with poverty and massive marginality to the emergence of what I identified years ago as the network, globally network criminal economy as one of the key segments of both society, economy, and institutional uh, crisis. There are, in, in this sense, um, and at the same time, I identified in my trilogy a resistance to the logic of networks. Not everything is being taken by the logic of networks, but also by the reaction to the networks and to the dominance of the networks, the affirmation of identities. Identities that refuse to be dissolved by the logic of networks. Identities based on religion, on sexual identity, on gender, on ethnic identity, on territorial identity. All these constituted an integral part of my theory from the beginning because I saw the two processes which I identified as the net and the self. And one key element which has not been tr truly developed either in my theory or in other theories I have seen is the increasing importance of the individual construction of a specific identities. Because all the identities that they identify are collective identities built on the materials of history. But there are also increasingly in all societies uh, the, the self-definition of identity which further fragments society. Um, myself and my identity versus whatever. 
But in all cases, identities represent a reaction to the dissolving logic of the networks. All this is in line of what I have been discussing and has simply expanded, dramatically expanded, and to some extent showing relative usefulness of what I proposed years ago. But there have been key changes in my, I wouldn't say necessarily theory, but in, my, in the social observation of the, what I proceeded with the categories of my theory. One important change is uh, uh, the, to correct the, um, uh, I would say, the romantic enthusiasm for the social networks at the beginning, which I share with my California libertarian culture of the time. Social networks, we should have known better, by being social networks of humans um, and being free communication networks, this, is, this continues to be so, they are free communication networks. But at the same time, uh, they have expressed the contradictions the fundamental contradictions of the human organization. Three, fundamentally. On the one hand, the, um, since capitalism is so expansive, it has deeply penetrated the logic of these social uh, media networks and uh, usher in data capitalism. Uh, we all know the, the, the old saying in Silicon Valley, you are not paying, you are paying with your data. And therefore, we all had been transformed into data. So on the one hand, yes, we are free to communicate more than ever, because the more we communicate freely, the more data we provide for free. And therefore, the political economy of data capitalists is one of the key segments. Just to illustrate one thing, 91% of Google revenue is linked to different forms of advertising. Advertising, which is not the traditional advertising, is the use of our data to focus uh, messages, to targeting, to sell, more or less legally, this is still in discussion. But clearly we all know that uh, the free communication, the social plat platforms has become an instrument of uh, gigantic capital accumulation based on the destruction of privacy. There is no privacy. If we use the networks, we systematically refuse to defend our privacy. There is no other way. The other thing is that, the, on the one hand, capital in, entered the logic of the networks. On the other hand, the other traditional uh, system of um, uh, restraint of liberty, the state, the old nemesis of society, the state. The state has found in the massive use of the social media networks a fantastic terrain for surveillance. Uh, so we are all sold and surveilled, clearly. Uh, and this is something which I, I have analyzed and theorized with my uh, good friend and colleague John Thompson at Cambridge. We developed a whole paper on this notion of uh, uh, the, the twin developments of the, these contradictions as uh, data capitalism on the one hand and the formation of global surveillance bureaucracies which are all interconnected and which have eliminated any possibility of escape to massive surveillance. Uh, I tried to be, uh, to create some images by describing these big brother and little sisters. Although the little sisters are not so little because they are Microsoft, uh, Google, etc. cetera. Um, the third issue which has changed, again, not so much my theory, but the social consequences that I have seen in my theory is the free communication networks have created the basis for the free expansion of human nature and of human attitudes, beliefs, and behavior. And gradually we discover 
that we are not necessarily good people, that humans are full of everything. Uh, we are angels or demons, and most of us are both angels and demons, depending on the day, the evening, the year, how we feel. And therefore, um, social networks that were the privileged platform for social movement, social change, the ability to create and imagine a new society, at the same time, have become the repository of racism, sexism, Nazism, uh, homophobic feelings, uh, destruction of democracy, and uh, more important than anything else, fake news. And therefore, the destruction of the idea of truth, the destruction of science, and therefore, the new assault on reason. All this is amplified, developed, by social networks, which are at the same time uh, platforms of freedom, platforms of free communication, platforms of creativity, both things. And we have to recover the old logic of dialectics that it's one and the other, the contradiction and the, between both. And yes, theoretically, there's synthesis, but the synthesis is still not there. Within this, uh, in terms of the, the development and the deployment of the theory of the network society, I then enter into the analysis of media politics as the fundamental form of politics in, uh, in our world. My book, Communication Power, was, some people call it the fourth volume of my trilogy because, of course, I saw the issues of power at the center of everything, but you know what? I didn't have time because uh, theoretically I was not going to have time. And therefore, uh, the issue of power was so, compli so complicated that I leave it on the side. When I finally discovered that I had some more time left, then I went into uh, the major attempt to identify the new mechanism of power, and that my book, Communication Power, published in 2009, 2010, in which I identified media politics, informational politics, social media as key elements of power. And, and the derivative of this analysis, which uh, I summarized in my book, uh, uh, Rupture, the Crisis of Liberal Democracies, showing the direct connection between this new kind of politics uh, and the crisis of liberal democracies and the crisis of political hegemony, the political legitimacy, gigantic crisis of political legitimacy all throughout the world, in which, empirically speaking, more than two-thirds of citizens in the world, and in many countries, 70, 80 percent, do not believe in their political institutions, in their politicians, in their parties, in anything. They do believe in democracy, but not in this one. And this, of course, introduces a fundamental crisis which is more important than the others, because if we don't have the tools, we don't believe in the tools to handle any of the other crises, we are orphans of institutions. And that my anarchist feeling means that maybe there is a chance there, but anarchy is not chaos. The use of the word anarchy is, is, is really a defamation of the ideals of the anarchy philosophy, which is a new order created by consensus, not chaos, not what is called anarchy. And for the moment, we are on the chaos side. And this leads me to the other major um, emphasis linked to my theory, which is the, the fate of the state. The state as the central actor throughout human history. The state supersedes the, notes, the, the political economy, capital, the state is a permanent, permanent form of organization, repression, domination of human life. I never believe in the neoliberal ideologies, particularly expressed sometimes in the analysis of nervous, that all this meant the supersession of the state, that there was globalization and nation states or states just disappear, dissolve. No, come on. Uh, we are seeing that dramatically. But even before that, what I analyzed was the transformation 
of the state into a different kind of a state, the, what I call huh, the network state. The network state, uh, which for me, the key example was uh, the European Union, it was a new form of a state in which all the nodes are important. Uh, through first-hand observation, I can tell you that before we open the mouth in anything related to any government in Europe, is always what Brussels says about this. Brussels is the magic word that frames and changes everything, the way of thinking. Before we think about anything, we think to think about Brussels. Brussels has the power, mm, yes and no. No, has money, huh? although the money is from Germany, basically, but it's something else. It's a coordinating node of all the, the, the nodes that form the actual European state, which is a network state. Well, with some effort, what we could think about other areas of the world which, in which also a network state of this kind has emerged. However, um, it's, it's not exactly that, because at the same time, the state as such is not always network and has strengthened its power in terms of domination and control. Um, I mentioned that surveillance and the end of privacy is comprehensive, and this has strengthened the dominant function of the state, the domination function. So not only the state has not dissolved, but has increased its capacity. Because being able to enter all our minds and to some extent symbolically manipulate our minds is more powerful than ever, even if they are not always able to legally torture. Moreover, military confrontation and military intimidation and prevention, which is a key element of the state, violence and the state are uh, link throughout history. Well, artificial intelligence has already transformed the forms of confrontation between states and has deeply altered everything. For instance, um, the, the key element these days is um, confrontation between drones, drones in swarming. There's we know the drones that surveil the world and, and shoot lasers and everything, but it's also the new tactics, which is already in the public domain, is uh, swarms of thousands and thousands of, of drones attacking each other or attacking targets. Now, these drones, uh, they are only can work in this way through incredibly powerful uh, mechanisms of artificial intelligence. And this example, uh, I could extend, this is one of the, the things that I do at 3 a.m. in the night, uh, try to study these things. We have a, by the way, next, next um, week a seminar in the Ministry of Defense of Spain about these matters for <laughs> you to see the diversity of my current activities. Um, and this is one example, but the combination of all the possible uses of artificial intelligence, military technology means one thing. Wars have never been very human, of course. It's the destruction of humankind, destruction of humanity, the negation of ourselves, killing. Or the threat of killing. Wars are also played in simulation models before actually going into practice, fortunately. But that means one thing. They have never been very human, but at this point they have been completely dehumanized. They are kids in the Nevada desert, uh, erasing from the earth one remote village in Yemen or one big city in Yemen with thousands of kids. Without saying anything, without feeling anything, that's a new, a, a new switch. Not that we have robotized the world. We have robotized ourselves. And therefore, the notion of introducing humanistic discussions and concepts into the conduct of wars is the only way to countervail the transformation 
by networks of information and communication of the military uh, activity, which is at the heart of the state. And then, of course, uh, cyber wars today of all kinds, uh, not only between states, but with corporations, with everybody, the manipulation of elections, as we know. Can you see the penetration of all these networks into the domination and activities of the state and the full transformation? We are going to be able, we have to, at this point, to protect every electoral process against the manipulation of this process by cyber attacks. So our cyber defenses or offenses have to be more powerful than ever. Is that the disappearance of the state or the strengthening of the state and the new conditions? So by network state, it was a very nice notion of the diffusion of power, but networks in the state are a different thing and they have strengthened the state extraordinarily. I would also say that this crisis of legitimacy and the fact that um, uh, of, of these processes have increased the autonomy of a state apparatuses as a state vis-a-vis -vis, uh, politics and elected politicians. States are more and more isolated, insulated, from the actual political game. And because politics, media politics, informational politics is a crisis of legitimacy, <clears throat> there has been <clears throat> an increasing shift from elected politics to the judicial system as the site of power, with increasing autonomy between elected politicians, elected governments, the state as an apparatus and the judicial system as the power, the ultimate resort of power uh, to cut across the increasing paralysis of the political system. And more than that, <clears throat> the, the worst of the worst, suddenly in our world, non-democratic states that were supposed to be bureaucratic, inefficient, unable to function, are the most efficient states. Not the nicest, but the most efficient. China, just to take an example, who has controlled the pandemic? China. Who is growing fast immediately afterwards? China. <coughs> Repressive state? Absolutely. Effective state? Absolutely too. So the networks of freedom, the advent of a new society from the power of the mind, creativity, etc., ultimately weakens the democratic state and strengthens the authoritarian state. And one last layer of my analysis. I would say that ultimately at this point, what we are seeing in these particular pandemics, which are, we are not out of it, remember, is the formation of what I call networks of global destruction. Networks of destruction. Why? Because the kind of what I call inhuman development that we have experienced in the last 10 years in these megapolitan areas, in this destruction of the public system in favor of massive privatization of services, has led to a series of recurrent health crises, which we started to identify 10 years ago. SARS-1, SARS-2, MERS, and uh, Ebola, and many other. This, this pandemic is simply the, the worst of a series of pandemics that were knocking the door of the world for a long time. This form of inhuman development is linked to uh, processes of destruction that um, may create 
our inability to inhabit the planet. The planet will be okay, by the way, without us. It's us in the planet, which is the problem. And it's very simple. The, the argument is very simple. Which is the pandemic? Well, viruses spread through what? Networks, huh? Networks of interpersonal contact. It's no, nothing else, huh? It's, now we have enough scientific evidence. We touch each other, we kiss each other, that's, or we talk to each other close enough, it's through the air, eh? it's aerosols. So, therefore, networks of interpersonal contact and physical contact, um, and therefore, uh, they um, become more um, violent by recurrent contact. Pandemics are networks, clearly speaking. But they are networks that are global. Because we, since we have globalized everything and all the contacts, transportation, uh, human uh, connection, etc., because the difference between the pandemics that existed throughout history is that something starts in Wuhan and in one month is all over the world. This is what you call globalization. Moreover, the notion here is that a global digital based macro network of all activities induces a fast speed multiple micro networks of contact between humans. The macro network of the structure of activities ultimately leads to micro networks of humans globally distributed. Of course, the only remedy to block the networks of personal interaction is the, this is the only remedy for the pandemics. This, on the one hand, means the turns to block border crossing, but we cannot. Then, science, vaccines, provisionally halted or is halting the crisis. Not entirely, because an even global development and because most of the world are still not able to vaccine. And since we don't have vaccines, will be multiple different strains that will e emerge. Today is the Brazilian uh, strain, tomorrow is the South African strain, the other day is the British strain, the other day is the India strain, and we keep going because since we do not we cannot confine the uses of the vaccine to one particular area of the world, and we do not share development with the rest of the world, things keep going and going and going. If you want to really have nightmares tonight, I would add that climate change, with all its manifestations, functions also globally through successive networks of destruction and uh, interaction. Um, like mass migrations, uh, different movements of the atmosphere, and scientists have started to establish the connection between the process of climate change and the development of pandemics. We know that this is going on. So, we, the ensuing crisis may connect to other network crises, like the collapse of the financial markets, sudden mass migrations, which are all network. Catastrophic events can only be avoided if we change social organization. This is the old mantra. And therefore, the regulatory role of the state is crucial. But how you regulate in a network state made of multiple interactions, values, and conflicting projects. For the time being, life is sustained by massive migration of activities to digital networks. This is one thing which the walk has been incredibly useful for the entire university system. Therefore, there is an acceleration of the digital transition to a fully network operational structure. Therefore, the logic of exclusion, inclusion in the networks amplifies. Who and what has the right to 
do teleworking. And therefore, the resistance of identities sharpens. Negationism roots into the assault on reason, negating on the basis of imagined identities, science, and therefore breaking up solidarity. States, under these conditions, withdraw on their territorial logics, in contradiction to the global digital logic that already is the one that operates the planet. And all this in the midst of the crisis of legitimacy, which has been deepened by informational politics and disrupted network social movements. In these conditions, more than ever, we need theory to understand a grounded theory on the emerging contradictions of the network society. Thank you very much. Thank you.